Welcome to the seminar series on sewer and pipeline engineering. My name is Bert Bosseler. I am the scientific director of the IKT, Institute for Underground Infrastructure. In this seminar session, we will deal with a special issue from the field of rehabilitation, and that is the question of the structural integrity of liners. At the beginning, I want to summarize some practical experiences, and then I will look in detail at the topic of structural integrity of liners, first for the case of pressure pipelines, and then also for the case of gravity pipelines. That means pipelines that are not under high internal pressure, but for which the case of external pressure can be more relevant. Let's start with some impressions from practice. Here we see a piece of pipe from a sewer section that was excavated many years after liner rehabilitation as part of one of our research projects. The old concrete pipe had been rehabilitated with a CIPP liner. The liner is still intact, that means it is stable, operationally safe and tight. If you look closely, you can also see that the liner is evenly round and that there is only a small annular gap between the liner and the old pipe. The size of this annular gap is, by the way, of great importance for stability. The smaller the gap, the better the pipe is supported and the higher the external pressures it can withstand. In this picture we see what happens when the liner can no longer withstand the external pressure. The pressure is highest in the bottom of the pipe and that is where the liner is pushed upwards. At extremely high pressures the liner then fails as we see in the picture. Of course, we want to prevent such a failure. The liner should neither buckle under external pressure, as in this picture, nor should it burst apart under internal pressure. And we will now look at these two cases in detail. Let's start with the pressure liners. A pressure pipe is under internal pressure. Here we see the overview slide that I have already shown on the subject of the structural safety of pressure pipelines in a previous session. The internal pressure causes circumferential stresses that can easily be calculated with the so-called Boiler formula or Barlow's formula. Internal pressure Pi times diameter Di gives a lifting force of the pipe half shelf and this force is exactly in equilibrium with twice the circumferential stress sigma C times the wall thickness T. We had learned that the longitudinal stress at internal pressure is exactly half the circumferential stress. And that was, after all, the reason why a sausage put in a microwave always cracks in the longitudinal direction and not in the transverse direction. For the rehabilitation, it is now crucial to know whether and how these forces and stresses are borne by the liner. And that brings us to the classification of liner systems for the rehabilitation of pressure pipes. According to the international standard ISO 11295, four liner classes are distinguished A, B, C and D. Let's start from the back with class D. Class D liners are non-structural. That means they primarily serve only to protect against corrosion from the inside. The conveyed medium is separated from the pipe wall by the liner. The liner itself adheres to the pipe wall as indicated by the dots on the liner line in the graphics. Coatings are such a typical product for corrosion protection. Class C is also bonded to the old pipe wall and protects the old pipe from corrosion. In addition, the liner can also bridge small holes and gaps in the wall. This can be, for example, already existing corrosion damage. However, if the corrosion was caused from the outside, the liner cannot stop it, of course. In the case of internal corrosion, however, the liner is a very good and safe option. In principle, class B does the same as class C. The liner bridges defects and protects against corrosion. For this reason, class B and class C both are also called semi-structural. Unlike class C, however, class B is not bonded to the old pipe. Under external water pressure, for example groundwater, the liner would collapse if it, didn't not, if it did not have its own stiffness. This stiffness is precisely the characteristic of a class B liner in contrast to class C. Class B has a certain inherent stiffness. Class A is then all but the royal class of pressure liners. 
The liner protects against corrosion, can bridge defects and can also bear the entire internal pressure on its own. The wall thickness of the liner is therefore such that the pressure can be taken up by the wall of the liner according to the boiler formula. This is why these liners are also called fully structural. In class A, a distinction is made between close-fitting liners and loose-fitting liners. The difference in load-bearing behavior is that a close-fitting liner can still transfer the load to the old pipe as long as the old pipe is still intact. So, in principle, an acceptance test still tests the structural stability of the old pipe and just the tightness of the liner. With the loose-fitting liner, on the other hand, the liner absorbs the load directly because it can expand freely under the load and thereby also cause the corresponding stresses in the wall. Another table in the standard summarizes the special load scenarios for the individual liner classes. The text in the first line is also interesting here. The liner can survive internally or externally induced failure of the host pipe. It's burst, bending or shear. As we can see, much more is required here than just the bearing of the internal pressure. If the old pipe fails, all loads, including earth loads and traffic loads, must be absorbed by the system of the liner, the host pipe and the soil. In addition, special forces can arise in bands. The internal pressure causes a resultant force in the band area that pushes the band outwards. In the case of large pressures, an abutment must usually be placed on the outside of the band so that the stresses in the soil do not become too great and that the band does not move outwards and break off. However, if the old band with abutment can no longer absorb these forces, a liner rehabilitation will not help either. A liner can seal the band, but it cannot restore its stability. To rehabilitate a non-stable band, we then have to dig up and replace the band and, if necessary, also improve the abutment. So we have just seen that a pressure pipeliner of class A not only has to withstand the internal pressure, but that other loads can also act on the pipe like earth loads and external water pressure. And these are loads that we are already well aware of in every gravity sewer. So let us now take a look at what the task of a liner is in a gravity sewer and what it can contribute to stability and how it is basically calculated in statics. To do this, let's first take a look at the rehabilitation object. A sewer that was laid using the open trench method carries the loads as shown in this picture. We have already discussed this sufficiently in the section on the stability of sewers and pipes in open cut construction. The earth loads can be reduced if there is a silo effect. That means if there is friction between the backfill soil and the existing soil. The vertical load is then distributed between the pipe and the soil next to it. The loads on the pipe are transferred vertically downwards into the support area. To counteract stress concentrations in the support area, the support is compacted evenly over as large an angle to alpha as possible. The lateral earth pressure then supports the pipe. If the pipe is structurally intact, liner rehabilitation can still make sense. This is the case of the sewer leaks along its entire length. The liner then only serves to seal the pipe string. However, we need a liner structural anal analysis in this case as well, because the liner must be stable against external groundwater pressure. If the old pipe is overloaded by the vertical load, there are usually four cracks. One crack in the crown, one crack in the bottom and two cracks on the left and right in the spring line. The whole thing can only be rehabilitated with a liner if the old pipe soil system also carries the load. For this, additional bedding reaction forces must be activated laterally. Here we see these illustrated schematically by triangular stresses. In this case too, the liner is primarily a sealing method and the structural anal analysis is about the stability under external water pressure. However, there is also an advanced case of application and that is when the old pipe salt system is no longer considered to be truly safe, 
That means when load increases would probably lead to a collapse of the old pipe salt system. In this case, the liner can also be used as a stiffening element that gives the system additional stiffness and safety. So we see that there are basically three situations for a liner system in structural terms. In the first case, the so-called state one, the old pipe is leaking but otherwise undamaged and fully load-bearing. In this case, the liner is only proven against external water pressure. In the second case, state two, the old pipe is already cracked, but the old pipe soil system is still stable. Here too, the liner only has to be proven against external water pressure. The difference to the first case is that the liner is installed in an old pipe that is already slightly ovalized. And ovalization weakens the liner's resistance to external water pressure. And this is taken into account in the structural analysis in case 2. Case 3 or state 3 is then already more deformed. The assumption is that if the load increases, the whole thing will deform to such an extent that it could collapse. The necessary safety under load increase is therefore missing and the stiffness of the liner is therefore also used to increase the stability against earth and traffic loads. A proof against external water pressure is of course also needed. Here we see the individual conditions again in detail. State 1 is a leaking old pipe, but otherwise still intact and stable. State 2 is a cracked old pipe, which however is still sufficiently stable together with the bedding reaction of the soil. However, the whole thing is already slightly overlized and this must be taken into account in the liner statics against external water pressure. Then state 3. The whole thing has not collapsed yet, but it already looks quite critical. Load increases are probably no longer possible. The liner must therefore also stiffen the system. However, a basic load bearing effect of the old pipe salt system is still necessary here. So we see, liners are primarily sealing systems. But in exceptional cases, the stiffening effect is also used for the static calculation against earth and traffic loads. But here too, the old system must still make the essential contribution to load bearing. It won't work without good bedding. Therefore, as a rule, the essential proof in a liner structural analysis is the proof against external water pressure. And we will now take a closer look at this. What does actually happen when the external water pressure is too high? Well, we already know this picture. The liner is buckled from below by the water pressure. This usually happens abruptly when the pressure exceeds a certain critical pressure. And this is therefore also called stability failure. Here we see the results of a calculation by the finite element method. The liner was modeled as a circular ring that lies in an outer circular rigid frame. This frame represents the old pipe. And there is a small gap between the liner and the old pipe. The graph then illustrates the pressure curve over the deformation. The greater the pressure on the vertical axis, the greater the diameter reduction of the liner. In picture 1, the liner is still circular. As the pressure increases, the underside of the liner flattens out, which can already be clearly seen in picture 2. In picture 3, we have the state of maximum external pressure. The underside of the liner is now completely flattened. There is no further load increase needed to deform the liner further. The liner deforms even further inwards at lower pressure, so it suddenly sags inwards from figure 3 to figure 4. And finally, figure 5, which corresponds to the picture we have just seen from the field. What is interesting now is how we can determine or at least estimate the maximum load even without FEM calculations. What static models can help here and which formulas can we then use in practice? First of all, I would like to point out that when a liner buckles in principle, nothing different happens than with other stability problems that we know only too well from the theory of statics. The best known example is the buckling of a bar. 
If a bar is pressed in the longitudinal direction, normal forces are dominant. If, however, the bar is not completely straight but slightly curved, then bending moments arise that correspond exactly to the force times the deflection of the bar. Then the problem of stability is that these bending moments usually lead to further deformations in the same direction. With very large normal forces, this creates an accelerating deformation and as a result, the bar suddenly buckles. The critical load at which this buckling occurs then depends on the stiffness of the bar and its bedding. In, four examples, in the four examples in this picture, the buckling force increases from the left to the right as the bar is bedded stiffer and stiffer. And now it is similar with a pipe or a circular ring. For a free pipe without bedding, the critical pressure at which the pipe can buckle is lowest. This case is shown in this picture. Timoshenko already calculated the critical pressure for a free circular ring analytically in 1961, and we see the corresponding formula here. Basically, the critical pressure is determined as P crit equals 3 times the modulus of elasticity E times the moment of inertia I divided by the radius R to the power of 3. For a solid walled pipe, the moment of inertia can be easily determined and then the whole thing can be transformed into the formula below. So for a solid wall pipe, the formula becomes the critical pressure P crit is equal to 2 times E times wall thickness T by diameter D to the power of 3. For a very long pipe, additional stiffening can also be taken into account by dividing the result by 1 minus nu squared. On the safe side, however, this term can be neglected. Then the critical pressure of the free unbedded pipe is simply P crit equals 2 times E times T divided by D to the power of 3. And this is actually easy to remember. With this formula, it is then possible to easily estimate what a liner alone can bear for a critical external pressure without any bedding. If higher pressures are applied, though, then the liner needs bedding by the old pipe. And there is also a formula for the case of ideal bedding. Glock already derived this formula in 1977. He assumed the case of a liner that is ideally embedded in an outer round pipe without any annular gap. The outer pipe is rigid and does not deform. The first question is, of course, how can the liner buckle under external pressure if there is no space between the liner and the outer pipe into which the liner can deform? Well, in principle this is true. Without a gap between the liner and the outer pipe, buckling is not possible. However, the liner not only has a bending stiffness, but also a normal stiffness. And that means that the liner will contract under external pressure. This is the opposite effect to inflation under internal pressure. Under internal pressure, the liner gets bigger, and under external pressure, the liner gets smaller. In other words, the external pressure creates an annular gap. And once this annular gap is so large, that the external pressure also represents the maximum load for the liner, then the liner suddenly buckles. Above we see the corresponding formula. This formula includes not only the bending stiffness, but also the normal stiffness of the liner. It can also be simplified for a solid wall pipe. The result is shown below. The critical pressure P crit is 1 times E times T divided by D to the power of 2.2. For long pipes, the same term is again added to account for the transfer strain nu, but we can neglect it to be on the safe side. What is truly striking is the high degree of similarity between this formula and the formula for the free unbedded pipe. We will take a closer look at this in a moment. But first, here is a picture of further calculation formulas that Tipo has derived. He has extended Glock's model to arbitrary cross-sections. Here we see an example for a defined egg profile geometry. The formula for the solid wall tube looks similar again, only the prefactor has changed. But let's get back to the circular liner. We have learned two formulas with which we can estimate the stability. 
The first formula we see here on the left is the formula for the free unbedded pipe. That means for the liner without any bedding or with a very large space between the liner and the old pipe. The second formula we see on the right is the formula for the ideal pipe in pipe system. That means for a liner installed in the old pipe without any annular gap. Now let's take a look at what this means in concrete terms for a calculation example. In this Example, we assume that the liner has a diameter of 500 mm with a wall thickness of 10 mm. We assume that the modulus of elasticity is 2500 megapascal, and we neglect the transfer strain. We set it to zero that was on the safe side. As a generally safety factor, we set gamma equal to 2.0. So it doesn't take much for such a calculation, only diameter, wall thickness and E modulus. So what is the minimum external pressure that the liner can definitely bear even without any bedding? And what is the maximum external pressure that it is only conceivable with an ideal pipe and pipe system? Here we see the solution. At the front we divide by the safety coefficient 2.0 and behind that we find the specific formula with our concrete values. As a result, we get a value of 0.02 MPa for the free unbedded liner, which corresponds to a pressure of 2 meters water column. And for the ideal system, we get a value of 0.23 MPa, which is 23 meters of water column. So we can see that the difference is immense compared to a free unbedded liner, more than 10 times to the external pressure can be applied to a liner ideally embedded in the old pipe before it buckles. For practical purposes, these figures are also an important indication with which we can easily check a static calculation for possibility. Let us imagine that a liner with exactly these characteristics has been statically verified for a load case of 15 meters external pressure then we can be quite sure that the geometric conditions in the static calculation were extremely optimistic because even in the ideal case, the liner can only bear a minimum of 23 meters. On the other hand, a static proof for 4 meters of water column with this liner could certainly be mastered without very complex bedding. After all, the liner can already support 2 meters of water column as a free pipe with a safety factor of 2. My recommendation is remember these simple formulas and you can check the possibility of a 30-page structural analysis with very simple means. But why is a precise structural analysis so time-consuming? Well, for example, according to the German standard, the general formula that we already know from Glock for the ideal pipe-in-pipe -pipe system is corrected with reduction factors in order to consider deviations from the ideal case. This concerns possible pre-deformations in the invert, ovalizations due to the deformation of the old pipe, and also possible initial annular gaps that already occur during installation. The individual prefactors are then determined by calculations or via nomograms. Then the critical buckling load of the ideal case is calculated and reduced via those prefactors as you can see on the slide. Another possibility can be seen, for example, in the American standard ASTM F1216. Here, the buckling load is calculated for the free pipe and then multiplied by an enhancement factor. So you calculate the worst case and then improve it by using enhancement factors. This is, of course, an interesting difference in the design philosophy between the standards. Once you reduce the ideal, the other time you increase the bad case. This naturally raises the question of whether something similar really comes out of these two calculation approaches. And the answer is a clear yes. Here we see the critical pressure normalized by the E modulus, plotted against the ratio of diameter to wall thickness. The dashed line corresponds to the values calculated according to ASTM, the solid line corresponds to the values according to the German standard. The dotted line is only a comparison line for the free pipe. Of course, the dashed line and the solid line differ. The slope in this double logarithmic representation is different because the exponent is also different. For the free pipe it is 3, 
For the ideal pipe and pipe system, it is 2.2. It is interesting to see where the curves intersect, and that is at a diameter to wall thickness ratio of about 30, which is typical for liner dimensions. For these dimensions relevant to practice, both formulas therefore produce more or less the same results. But it is not only about the liner geometry. Plastics can also creep and that is often represented in the static calculation by calculating with the long-term and the short-term modulus of elasticity. But what does that actually mean? Is the modulus of elasticity then time-dependent? It sounds as if a new pipe is stiffer under load than an older pipe, but that is not the case. It is about something else. The modulus of elasticity does not change over time. The mathematical correction only serves to take creep effects into account in the statics. Here we see a picture from a so-called creep test. The pipe here, for example, a plastic liner with 1200 mm diameter is under constant vertical load. With a purely elastic material, the deformation would then also be constant. However, this is not the case with plastic. The pipe deforms slowly but continuously in the vertical direction. And what does this have to do with a calculated modulus of elasticity? Well, let me explain this step by step. On the right, we see the course of deformation over time. Right at the beginning, there is an elastic initial deformation. Then the deformation increases linearly on a logarithmic scale. We can still measure the first four values. The last value we estimate as an extrapolation of the straight line. For example, as the deformation after 50 years of load. The modulus of elasticity is defined as stress divided by strain. Here we get the short-term modulus by dividing the stress by the short-term strain at the start of the test. The long-term modulus after 50 years is then obtained by dividing the same stress by the strain value after 50 years. With this parameter, we can then use the same formulas as for a purely elastic material and prove that the liner is still stable over 50 years under constant load. Of course, the stiffness of the liner has not changed. If it were subjected to a short-term load again after 50 years, it would still respond with the same short-term strain. If the material behavior were to actually change, it would be aging, that is decomposition under environmental influences. Here, however, the long-term modulus of elasticity is about creep behavior and not about aging. We have now learned a lot about the influence of geometry and material properties on our liner statics. Finally, I would like to illustrate this once again with a calculation example. The design task is shown on the right. The old pipe is in condition state 1, that means it is fully load-bearing. The groundwater level is 3 meters above the pipe, the old pipe has a nominal diameter of 300 millimeters, and the CIPP liner has a wall thickness of 6 millimeters. If there are deviations in production of this liner, the stability of the liner against external water pressure will be reduced. The effect of a deviation can be seen in the examples in this picture. In each case, we see deviations that lead to a 50% reduction in stability. Let's start with the E-modulus. A reduction by half leads to a loss of stability of about 50%. Well, this is not surprising because the E-modulus was included in all buckling formulas in a linear way. Let us now take a look at the pre-deformation in the liner base. A wrinkle with a depth of 1 cm already leads to 50% less stability with this liner. Such a wrinkle is so critical because it goes in the same direction as the Fehner mode for buckling. Let us then move on to the annular gap. If the liner is installed with an annular gap of only 3 mm, the buckling safety is also reduced by 50%. So we see Annular gap formation is a very critical story. Annular gap means loss of bedding and thus a lower critical external pressure. The system is also very sensitive to changes in wall thickness. A change of 1.2 mm in this case accounts for 20% of the liner thickness. And that 
is already enough for a 50% reduction in stability. This is because the wall thickness is included in the calculation of the stiffness to the third power or the power of 2.2. All in all, we can see that even small deviations can lead to a significant reduction in stability. Quality assurance is therefore important with regard to geometry and to the material properties. In addition to material tests, it is always worth taking a look inside the sewer after rehabilitation for example by means of a CCTV inspection. In this picture we can clearly see transverse folds around the circumference of the liner. So how do we assess this? Well, in principle a rehabilitation has to achieve the same as a new construction. And that means stability, tightness and operational safety. And all three are over the entire planned service life. So we should evaluate this observation according to these criteria. Let's start with stability. A transverse fold, like a transverse crack, is only a local deviation. If the liner in front of and behind the fold is made as planned, a transverse fold should not be a problem. In addition, it, is, it has also a stiffening effect similar to a profile pipe. More critical is the tightness over the service life. The fold offers a point of attack for sewer cleaning. High pressure jets can cause damage here in the long term, so we should be careful when cleaning. Operational safety seems to be okay in principle, as the cross-section is hardly reduced. Calculations have also shown that a few millimeters of folds do not pose any risk of unusual sedimentation. Let's look at this picture. Here we see a longitudinal fold at the pipe crown that clearly protrudes into the cross-section. Basically, with such phenomena that occur over the entire length of the sewer, we must of course expect that the statics may be affected. However, that may not be the case here. Obviously, the liner is a needle-felt liner. The liner was probably slightly too large for the old sewer. The fabrication was therefore faulty. The excess felt has built up towards the inside. We remember, however, that with felt liners it is not the felt but the resin that is actually the relevant load-bearing system. The decisive factor here is whether there is enough resin behind the felt to close the circular ring. In this case, the protruding felt can be milled away and the actual load-bearing system remains intact. However, if there is a gap behind the felt, then this is certainly critical in terms of stability. Operationally safety and tightness, however, are less affected here. In this last picture, we see damage caused by the unsuccessful drilling of a house connection. Obviously, the position of the house connections had not been measured correctly before the rehabilitation. The white spots are then incorrect drillings before the actual connection was found. Such damage must of course be repaired these spots are definitely leaking. This brings me to the end of this session. There is already a lot of practical experience on the stability of liners. Many liners have survived safely for many years, but in some cases there have also been failures, especially under external water pressure. Pressure liners can be divided into classes. They can contribute to corrosion protection, they can bridge defects and gaps, and they can also take up the internal pressure completely and independently. For gravity liners, however, the external groundwater pressure is particularly relevant. Depending on the condition of the old pipe, the static proof must then be carefully carried out for the liner against this external water pressure. Calculation formulas for the extreme cases of the completely free unbedded liner and the ideal pipe and pipe system help to check the possibility of a structural analysis. In extreme cases, the liner can also additionally stiffen the old pipe soil system. And creep of plastics is definitely different from aging of plastics and must be considered in the calculation. And with regard to geometry, the annular gap and the wall thickness are of particular relevance for all proofs of stability. Thank you.